All right. Thank you uh, to everyone for joining us today. My name is Jenna Walzak. I'm an Ag Climate Resiliency Specialist on the Cornell Cooperative Extension Harvest New York team. Um, and this is the first in the first webinar in the series. Uh, that's the 2023 Hudson Valley Farming Webinar and Field Day series, Farming in the Changing Climate. Um, so I want to start off by thanking all the partners who have helped put together this series, um, including Cornell Cooperative Extension, Ulster County, CCE Orange County, CCE Columbia and Green Counties, uh, New York Soil Health, Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming, Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District, Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, New York State Ag and Markets, and the Soil and Water Conservation Committee, um, and the Harvest New York team. Um, just a few housekeeping points um, to start us off, if everyone can make sure that you are on mute, and that if you have any questions, please put those in the chat. We'll have a few opportunities for questions. Um, during the webinar and then afterwards. So I would like to start off by um, welcoming our speaker today, Joseph Amsili. Um, thank you, Joseph, for joining us today and putting together this great presentation. Um, so Joseph is an extension agent with the Cornell Soil Health Program and New York Soil Health Initiative, where he coordinates extension and research activities. Joseph completed his master's at Penn State, where he was part of a research group studying the multiple benefits of cover crop monocultures and mixtures for farmers. His master's research focused on comparing cover crop root traits and on tracing cover crop rhizodeposition, the organic carbon released from living plant roots, into stable fractions of soil organic carbon. For the last four years, Joseph has been leading New York Soil Health's effort to characterize soil health across region, soil type, and cropping system to develop benchmarking tools and soil health goals specific to New York farms. Joseph is also currently researching the effects of soil type, tillage, and cropping system on carbon stock stocks at New York sites as part of his PhD work. So um, thank you again, Joseph, for joining us here today. And um, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenna, for organizing and Zach. Um, and it's it's great to be here or virtually here with with a bunch of, of folks, um, professionals and farmers from the Hudson Valley region. As everyone knows, New York State is big, so I don't get over there as much as I would like. Um, but yeah, today we're going to be talking about um, carbon and nitrogen cycling in agricultural systems. And as you can imagine, <clears throat> It's a very big topic to squeeze into 45 minutes, but I've tried to do my best to introduce some of the concepts, processes, some of the data um, that, um, that shape the carbon and nitrogen cycle with a focus on agricultural systems. So you'll see, or maybe notice that I've left out some things um, that are more for natural systems or oceans and things like that. So, um, just kind of a broad foundation for the elements that are essential for plants and involved in agricultural cycling. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about car the carbon, but I don't want folks to remember um, the other elements. So we don't usually consider these ones as nutrients because they're available in abundant supply. Um, and then we're going to be talking about nitrogen, which is the most important limiting nutrient for plants but also humans have dramatically shaped the nitrogen, affected the nitrogen cycle and the amount of reactive nitrogen in the environment. Um, so we're gonna be talking about that, but don't want you to lose sight of these other nutrients that are all cycling as well. So first um, we're gonna be talking about the carbon cycle and soil organic matter. And I've designed this presentation to have some break points during it. So while I'm talking, um, think about questions, put them in the chat, and at these breakpoints, we'll be able to maybe field a question or two during the presentation, and then we'll have time at the end for questions as well. So the carbon cycle and soil organic matter, this is my uh, soils lens that we're going to be looking at today. I'm really interested in, in soil organic matter dynamics and, um, and the carbon cycle. 
So here you see the terrestrial and the ocean carbon cycle and, and some very beautiful rich soil high and soil organic matter. Um, so the reason that the carbon cycle, we've been talking a lot about the carbon cycle and has um, received a lot of attention from the public across is, is, is the potential for a solution within agriculture to, to draw down some carbon within soils to serve as a soil, um, a climate mitigation strategy. Also, there's some win-win because increasing soil organic carbon increases soil health and soil functioning, et cetera. Um, so the most important thing, it's the same if you haven't looked at this a lot, soil organic matter is the largest terrestrial carbon sink. So much more, two to three times as much um, in soils, and that's mostly in organic matter. And there's some can, can be some confusion there than in all of above ground plants and in the atmosphere. And it's, and this isn't the carbon cycle you learned in high school. It's, um, or maybe you got a little bit in college. This, these numbers are, are changing all the time. And I just updated this morning how much um, carbon is in the atmosphere. Um, and we're having, getting better understanding of how much is stored in the soil. Um, and without, before of us even thinking about all of, of, of a, a, a huge hype about regenerative farming to build soil organic matter as a climate mitigation strategy, humans are basically dumping in nine units. These are what we call pedograms into the atmosphere. And one thing that's really interesting is the oceans and, and land have already been kind of taking up a portion. So we would be in big trouble if all of this nine was just going into the atmosphere every year. But luckily, due to reforestation and, and some carbon dynamics in the soil and oceans taking up a little bit, we don't have as much of that. So, so the original source of, of carbon, of course, is for at least for plants and photosynthesis is in the atmosphere. And this is a really important point that soils are the largest terrestrial carbon sink and this carbon is, is stored in organic and inorganic forms. And I'm mostly gonna highlight the organic um, in places like the Southwest um, of the US, the inorganic forms of, of carbon are become more important. But for this conversation, this lecture, we're just gonna be talking about these organic. So as you know, from high school, CO2 is fixed from the atmosphere into plant biomass through photosynthesis. And then that plant derived organic carbon makes its way into the soils. Pretty much all of it has to go through microbes and over time, some of that stays in the soil. So here's some important terminology. I think even um, if you study this a lot and talk about this a lot, you can, it's easy to confuse yourself. Um, so soil organic matter is, is kind of everything of that organic material. It contains that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, and all the other elements that are in organic matter. And when we talk about soil organic carbon, we're, it's kind of more of an accounting tool um, to understand just that carbon within soil organic matter. So soil organic matter is maybe on the range of 50 to 65% carbon. Um, so sometimes we talk about soil organic matter and soil organic carbon kind of interchangeably, but it's important to know that distinction. And since it's Friday, never forget your schnapps. This is a useful moniker I learned um, in high school to remember those main ingredients of organic matter, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So here's, here's again, and I can share these slides just so you're up to date with some of these current numbers. Um, but we, we talked about that already. Um, and at, at a global scale, and, and, and locally as well, we'll talk about this later, the amount of soil organic carbon is really controlled by the balance between the inputs, the amount of organic matter, organic carbon coming into the system, and the amount of outputs leaving through that annual decomposition of organic matter. Our management affects that. And then also erosion can take that top, that rich topsoil away from the soil leaf, taking away higher organic matter soil. 
So this is, a, I think, a really easy and simple framework to be thinking about how to build soil organic matter. Either we got to increase inputs or reduce the outputs. So what is soil organic matter from a organic chemistry perspective? I guess we say all the material in the soil that contains reduced carbon, that's carbon bound to hydrogen. Um, but that's kind of a nerdy definition, but it's intuitive. You guys understand what organic material is. And we just call it soil organic matter if it's um, found in the soil. So soil organic matter is derived of a, a plant residue, both litter and roots, um, animal remains and, and soil biomass. And what's really been cool over the last um, 20, 30 years is, is our recognition that actually a lot of the organic matter that's stable in the soil is, um, is microbial biomass parts and, and, and um, remains of, of, of living microbes. So over time, that crop residue comes in or different types of organic matter comes in. And most all of it, I mean, there's, there's plant residue that we find in the soil, but most all of it passes through bacteria, fungi, actinomycetes, and other microbes. Um, and there's a really cool analogy, like all of this organic matter must pass through the eye of, the, of a needle, as some people say. So that, and that, that needle is, is microbes. And some of that over time becomes stable, but not all the inputs persist in the soil, of course. And, and a bunch is lost as CO2 because like us, we, we, we burn our, we eat our pasta, get some energy from it and, and burn off a lot as, as CO2 as we're doing our, going about our daily life. So this is, so there's some different ways to think about the different types of organic matter. Obviously there's living organisms, um, which I'll talk about. And we can think about the dead stuff. These are kind of fresh residues. Um, and then we could call it maybe very dead. And this is organic matter that for some reason, for some reason, we'll talk about those different mechanisms or processes that help stabilize organic matter. The organic matter, this organic matter pool sticks around for longer. But all three of these play a really important role in helping to produce high functioning soils and and high yielding crops. So the living, these are organisms of various sizes, bacteria, actinomycetes are also bacteria, but the filamentous bacteria, um, different types of fungi, saprophytes that break down, maybe more complex, are able to break down more complex types of organic matter that, that the bacteria can't do. And, and those are things like the lignin and cellulose and, and woodier tissue. Our buscular mycorrhizal fungi are incredibly important organisms and basically have symbiotic relationships with most of our agricultural plants and enable them um, basically extend the root system. So we can think of the root system and, and the micro, mycorrhizal fungi help basically virtually extend the amount of surface area that the root system has access to. And that's really important um, for nutrients that that move by diffusion, which is like for phosphorus and zinc. Um, so really important organisms. And then we have some of our simpler um, microfauna, which are really important for these guys work on the bacteria, actinomycetes and fungi. And actually there's been some cool work that's shown by having those in the system, they help to increase the nitrogen cycling because uh, they're, they're messy eaters. And, and as they eat those bacteria, actinomycetes, and fungi, some of those mineral nutrients are released that can be taken on by plants. And we have some of our bigger, bigger organisms that are shredders. These help um, break down organic matter into smaller sizes so the bacteria and fungi can access them. And then our, our soil engineers, um, which help physically move a lot of soil each year and concentrate nice um, a lot of nutrients and carbon in these soil casts and help create these wonderful biopores which help with infiltration etc so 
this is a great um, resource, Soil Food Web, and this is from the Soil Biology Primer that the NRCS released. Nice, nice visual for thinking and um, talking about the these interactions. Um, and it's we know we have known a lot. We've learned a lot that these fine roots and our muscular mycorrhizal fungi are really important for building building aggregates as well. So what do roots do? This is a, a passion of mine as well. And you could download this cover crop root poster um, from our website to put in your barn or your office. So living roots are essential and help create biopores that, that act as channels for infiltration. And if water can move through the soil, then, then air and oxygen can follow that. But if, obviously, if water can't flow, then then, then air can't get in as well. And also a lot of these roots, when we'll, um, some of these species are actually well adapted at maybe breaking up, I mean, growing through more compacted soil. And this can be really essential um, for something like a, a soybean root or something. They're not gonna, if there's a biopore already in the soil available, they're just gonna take that path of least resistant rather than creating their own path themselves. So as I said, um, fine roots and their associated mycorrhizal fungi help to promote and build, rebuild soil aggregates. Um, and you can see some of these have some serious amounts of fine roots at the soil surface, annual rye, grass, and grasses that are really well adapted to that. Um, obviously, roots help to transfer organic matter deeper into the soil profile, where maybe it won't get chewed up as fast by microbes. And basically, roots roots are carbon pumps. You can think a, a really important management strategy is have living plants growing all all year round because what they're doing is, as they're growing, roots are sloughing off. Um, they're releasing some exudates. A lot, yeah, a lot of root turnover at the root tips. They're growing through hard soil, and and roots are dying. Um, so they're basically feeding the life in the soil all year round, which is Kind of categorically different than the above ground um, inputs that that just kind of go in when you mow or terminate your terminate your crop. Um, and I like using this term rhizodeposition rather than exudates because exudates are just really fine, very small molecules that the roots release pa um, actively or passively. But this rhizodeposition concept talks about is really all about root turnover and lumps everything of all those organic matter inputs that come from living roots. Um, and there's a lot of um, also different, some different allelo chemicals that can inhibit weeds. Um, also, just the act of the roots growing and competing for water and nitrogen can, are, are important mechanisms also for weed suppression. So the dead, this is very, intuitive. These are the recently dead organisms or crop residues. And this is kind of the fresh stuff that helps um, drive all of the life in the soil to do what they need to do, because like us, they need, they need energy. So fresh inputs um, provide that, that carbon source to fuel all of the microbial life, starting with the microbes and then other stuff above eats, eats those microbes. And this is the organic matter that microbes can mineralize really quickly into plant available nutrients. And then there's this very dead pool. Um, and we'll look at a different name for that. And this is some of the organic matter that's remained stable. And historically, we called this humus. But our new view, our new scientific view is, is um, finding, has found basically better ways and more accurate ways to describe this. So some of that is some of the stabilization of organic matter in the soil has to do with organic matter associating with minerals. And that helps it be more difficult for microbes to be able to access that organic matter. It's kind of protected when it's associated with, with minerals. And the other mechanism is you can imagine an aggregate and potentially there's some small organic matter in the aggregate but certain microbes can't make their way in that aggregate. So there's some physical protection as well. So our view is kind of changing. Um, 
and there's a lot of soil scientists that that don't like using this word anymore and that's it's fine to use it but just to make you aware of that and this more stable organic matter that that doesn't turn over as quickly um, is really important for increasing soil water holding capacity mainly through microporosity and you can think of that here with this picture of an aggregate um, and especially in a sandy soil a sandy soil has a lot of bigger pores so by adding more organic matter, you can kind of clog those bigger pores and create more micropores that allow the soil to retain water um, against, against gravity. And obviously, especially again in sandy soils, um, this, this stable organic matter helps to hold on to, to nutrients like um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, ammonium, um, so it basically creates more charge sites for those for those nutrients to be held in the soil. And obviously now we're really we're talking a lot about carbon sequestration and, and storage as a as a function that the soil can provide, a service that the soil can provide as well. So this is another um, way of thinking about organic matter pools, and it kind of relates to the one I just showed you but there's kind of more fresh particulate organic matter. And that's kind of the stuff that's that comes from shoots and roots that's, that's maybe recently dead or um, some manure pieces. And then there's this, a lot of soil scientists are starting to measure these separately and this mineral associated organic matter pool. So we could also simplify this and call this labile or easy to decompose or fresh. And then there's some organic matter that's more stable. And I just want to introduce that because I think we're going to be hearing more about that um, in the future. So how is organic matter stored in soils? I've talked about this a little bit, some, some strong chemical bonds between organic matter and especially fine silt and clay and iron and aluminum oxides and calcium and, and things that help to basically protect that organic matter chemically from microbes trying to decompose it. We could also have some physical protection from decomposition within an aggregate. Um, so aggregates are important for stabilizing carbon as well, because maybe some microbes or some smaller animals, microfauna can't get in and access that. So humification may be still a little bit important, but much less important than we previously thought. And then biochar. So here's some, um, these, what these call these terra preta soils in, in Brazil, and they've, they've been found in other places as well. And Debbie Aller in two weeks is gonna have a whole lecture on biochar. So she'll be able to talk to you about this one in much more detail. Sorry. So now maybe we can take some questions from the chat. Is there any in the chat? Yes, we have one question in the chat so far, and it's, um, I think, goes off of what you were just uh, speaking about, Joseph, and, and related to biochar. Um, so maybe if you want to give us a little preview of, of that, um, what role does biochar play in balancing the carbon cycle and increasing carbon sequestration in the soil? Yeah, that's a good question, and Debbie's definitely going to go more in depth in, in her lecture. But one of the interesting things about biochar and biochar is basically made by this process called pyrolysis, where at low oxygen to temperature, um, low oxygen and high temperatures, kind of like making charcoal, we're um, basically not allowing combustion to go all the way. And it turns out this byproduct, this char or biochar is the stuff that we add to soils. That's the, um, in our studies um, have been shown to be, have much long, persist in the soil much longer than, than unpyrolyzed organic matter. And there's natural situations where that happens with forest fires and, and people study that in natural environments, but humans can do that as well, um, creating biochar. Um, but I think there's a lot of challenges as well as like biochar is, is very expensive. There takes extra processing steps to, to do it. 
So I think it's going to be, at least at this moment, is going to be more limited to our kind of horticultural industries and industries that are doing, working at a smaller scale than field crops or processing vegetables and things like that. But um, hopefully that answered some of it. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll do some of these at the end, um, because I think we could easily get stuck here for a while. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, let's just see how much time we have at the end, and then we'll take some more questions. So now we're going to talk about soil organic matter dynamics and management, and really, um, from a management perspective, this all has to um, this all has to do with this balance between inputs and outputs. So here we have now we're really in our using our agricultural lens. We have our crop residues, crop roots, manure, compost as inputs to the soil organic matter pool, and our losses are decomposition and erosion and leaching. So there's constant turnover of organic matter and soils, and when inputs equal the outputs, we're able to we maintain that soil organic matter pool, which sometimes in a high soil organic matter soil, that's that's as good as you're going to do. Um, but if our losses um, get bigger than our inputs, potentially in a situation where we were not returning crop residues, I think um, potentially you can think of corn silage system, continuous corn silage systems that are basically removing more than 90% of the above ground biomass. So there's very little going back in it and then our annual losses are bigger. So over time we can degrade the soil that way. And then if our inputs increase and our losses remain the same, this is a goal for I think for a lot of, a lot of farmers that organic farmers have always been thinking this way and, and regenerative farmers that wanna build the soil organic matter pool to maybe reduce um, other inputs they might be adding to the system, then we can hopefully build this pool. Um, so I think it's really important to be thinking about this carbon and nutrient cycling and balances, because I think a lot of what we're learning has to do with how much are the total amount of inputs that are going into the system um, is really important. So we can think of these extremes of carbon and nutrient cycling and the different carbon balances they have at the end of the year, the average over, over many years. So we have our natural or pasture systems for maybe 90 to 100%, basically virtually all of the above ground biomass on site and all the roots are returned at, um, at that site. We don't have any disturbance from tillage. So this, this is kind of the best case scenario. We're returning all of the above ground biomass. We have living living bi above ground biomass production, photosynthesizing all year round. We don't have any tillage, so we have very happy worm. And then on the other extreme, the systems that we're really asking a lot from in our agricultural systems, um, potentially when you harvest the corn, um, the corn grain, it's pretty amazing to think about how, how, how good the corn does at concentrating those carbon and nutrients into that corn grain. Um, so that if you just harvest the grain, um, 50 to 70% of the carbon and nutrients, and this, this range is, is for different nutrients as well. So it's higher for like things like nitrogen and phosphorus when you export it, but carbon is maybe somewhere around 50, 60%. So just the just the corn cob, which seems like a small amount, um, is about fifty to seventy percent of the carbon and nutrients. Um, processing vegetables, you could think of as even worse, um, and maybe only thirty to fifty percent of that biomass is returned to the soil. We're tilling the system. We're also having some CO two loss from tillage. Potentially, we're leaving the soil bare during certain times of the year, so we're getting erosion losses, and this. Um, over time, if we're not adding supplemental organic matter inputs, we're going to be degrading the soil because basically um, we're, we're adding, we're taking away more than, than, than is being added back to the system. So this is, um, I think, 
we can think of this as, as two paradigms and also relates to how we've managed through soil through history of feeding the soil versus feeding the plant. So natural systems, as I talked, high soil organic matter inputs, little disturbance, all the carbon um, that's produced on site is recycled. That decomposing organic matter feeds all the life in the soil and that mineral um, as organic matters decomposed by or organisms, those mineral nutrients feed the plants. And in the onset of agriculture, um, we started to harvest some of those inputs, but before we were able to um, use synthetic fertilizers and things like that, um, we still we still had to rely on basically building fertility with um, manure and legume rotations and stuff like that. Um, the danger in, in terms of soil health, we had this, um, our agricultural revolution after World War II um, had many positives and enabled us to stop famines of, around the world and basically to use, use a shortcut of chemical fertilizers to feed plants directly, to feed the plants directly with the mineral nutrients. So we didn't have to rely on these these organic matter inputs anymore, manure, legume rotations necessarily. So the advantages, of course, is chemical fertilizers were more nutrient dense, easy to transport. But the main disadvantage and the soil health, what created a huge soil health problem is we stopped feeding soil organisms. We replaced the nutrients, but not the carbon and combined with intensive tillage and not replacing that organic matter that's lost every year led to rapid soil degradation. So some of the tips, um, managing organic matter to build healthy soils. So I think regularly add diverse types of organic matter inputs. I think this relates to Laura Lengnick's question a little bit. Um, having, um, having different types of, of organic matter inputs with different um, carbon nitrogen ratios and different um, chemistry, I think um, is an important, important element. And um, these different organic matter input types serve different functions in the soil. So obviously, and then crop rotation is really important. And the, the best thing to rotate in with annual crops is having a perennial sod like an alfalfa or red clover stand for a couple of years. Obviously, the challenge is farmers don't have enough land to always be able to do that. So we want to be able to thinking about reducing organic matter losses from decomposition and erosion. Um, a strategy is generally reducing reducing tillage in some in some different ways and 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 protecting the soil from erosion. So keeping the soil covered with living vegetation or residue, we can think of this as armor, and also those living roots are kind of holding things in place. And this is not a strategy for building organic matter, but I think it's an important thing to think about. There's this paper called the Soil Organic Matter Dilemma. Shall we hoard it or use it? So I think with this carbon sequestration talk, I think we can get really um, excited about building our soil organic matter, but we also have to recognize that there's also benefits of, of that organic matter decomposing annually and, and cycling. And that's a, a reason that people like to till, till a lot because they see that effect of organic matter mineralization and those mineral nutrients that are um, release with it. So we need to think about the benefits of, of building it and also the benefits of it it's cycling naturally. So here's a caveat. Um, get to know your carbon and nitrogen ratio, carbon nitrogen ratios, which will determine if there will be a net nitrogen release or there will be tie up. And it usually it's about at this 20 point of carbon nitrogen ratio, about 20. Less than 20, we have net mineralization, we call it, or net release of nitrogen, and then greater um, net mobilization or net tie up. So, this is really important in thinking about those organic matter inputs that you're adding to the system. So, what are the con other controls on soil organic matter cycling? We're going to talk about some of the natural factors, um, climate, and soil type. So thinking globally, this is this is one you can do in the chat. What biome would you expect to find soils with the highest amount of organic matter?
Anyone have an answer to that? So yeah, it makes deciduous. And a lot of people say prairies, but it turns out it's um, boreal forests. So here's a, here's a map of soil organic carbon stocks globally. And you can see these biggest ones are um, in, in North, North America, these boreal tundral peatlands, which basically they have, um, they have, they don't have as much potential inputs to the system as a prairie or other sites, but what they do have is they're very wet and cold. So they have very slow rates of decomposition. So a most of the organic matter that comes into the system persists. This is kind of an interesting ex exception out here. We think of hot, hot, wet places as places where decomposition goes really fast, but if it's too wet, then decomposition doesn't, doesn't go very fast. So we also see this in the US, effects of temperature and moisture on soil organic carbon stocks. Places that are cooler and wetter. Um, what's driving the drier and wetter is basically uh, wetter places have higher amounts of organic matter that can be put into the soil. Um, and then places that are cooler have slower decomposition rates. Um, so we, we see this um, in the US as well. And then relating back to is that our different soil types also control the amount of organic matter that can be stored. So fine textured soils can store more organic matter than coarse textured soils, mostly because um, that fine silt and clay, which has a lot of surface area, is really good at um, stabilizing organic matter. So we see that with our New York data across some different soil texture groups. Um, that organic matter, organic carbon is highest in these fine textured soils than coarse textured soils. And that's what we use to interpret so interpret data. So if you're in a coarse textured soil, 2.5 might be, that's a pretty average value. But if you had a 2.5 in a silt loam soil, that would, you would be much lower than, than that soil's capacity to build organic matter. So remember that soil organic matter is stabilized by its association with fine silt and clay in addition to some other things. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the human management, um, effects of crop rotation, cover crops and tillage on soil organic matter cycling. So what management changes can be made to increase inputs of organic matter? And, and you probably all know this, adding cover crops to your rotation. Here's some really beautiful, a really beautiful picture from the Hudson Valley Farm Hub growing a ginormous summer um, cover crop mix, probably growing about 12,000 pounds of biomass per acre there. And yeah, it's really uh, adding, adding that quantity of inputs can really help, help drive these, these things faster. So diversify your crop rotations and in parentheses perennial sods. Here's a beautiful picture we took during the soil health specialist course at Stonehouse Grains of some beautiful stands of red clover um, that were going to be great to go into a, a cash crop with potentially or so return more crop residues I think um, um, we really need those crop residues to cycle back in the system there's some sometimes we harvest those for silage forage but um, those are essential ingredients for, for building soil if our soil is unhealthy. And of course, there's a lot of different organic amendments, composts, manures. Here's some injection of some manure happening. Um, and cover crops, of course, we're adding more biomass to the system. So research has found that they help to increase soil organic carbon or at least maintain it if it's high enough. Um, and this is from a paper which basically brought together a huge number of studies comparing cover crops to no cover crops and looking at that effect on soil organic carbon. So on average, it's about um, 0.4 tons of carbon per acre per year, which only equates to a 0.03% in organic matter per acre per year. But obviously this is average. So there's a lot of differences between 
cover crop isn't a cover crop and then a cover crop. Um, sometimes we kill our cover crops early because we need to get in there. We don't have a big window. And then sometimes we're able to produce more biomass. So this is, this, this is just an average and you could be um, more out here. If you've got a ton of carbon per acre per year into your soil, um, that would, let's see if I, if I get this right. Um, actually, so I'll skip that for now, but then you could potentially be getting up to the 0.1 or maybe 0.2, but 0 0.1 from a cover crop increase would be really good in a year. So what management changes can be made to decrease soil organic matter losses? Decreasing tillage, and I, and I don't wanna, I'm not a person that thinks that tillage is the worst thing ever. I think tillage has its role, especially in organic systems, but, but less is more. If you can figure out creative strategies to do less, obviously less passes means less diesel fuel, less manpower, but also less stirring of the soil. I know we, we really love this aesthetic um, for especially in horticultural systems or mixed organic mixed vegetable systems, but potentially maybe we don't have to do this level of full width tillage in our systems. And obviously decreasing erosion especially a concern on any, any fields with any slope, but this is, this is taking away our, our most rich topsoil at the surface. So how does tillage affect soil organic matter decomposition? We basically, residues that might've been dropped on the soil surface, tillage is maybe making them smaller pieces, but also putting them intimate contact with the soils between the soils and the residues and the decomposers that have access. So if it's on the surface, there's not as much microbial access, but once you put it in the soil, then microbes are in direct contact with that organic matter. Also quickly aerates the soil right after tillage. So you stimulate um, a lot of decomposition potentially if oxygen was limiting for that. We potentially are breaking up soil aggregates, which exposes organic matter that, that was previously more protected. And obviously more tillage promotes erosion losses and leaves the soil unprotected if we have a big rainfall event. So no-till or reduced tillage, strip tillage, zone tillage leaves much more crop residue on the surface. Um, and, and that crop residue left on the surface actually has important roles for helping to keep the soil cooler, which can help keep the microbes happier in some situations. Protects the soil, especially from erosion, that slow decomposition of crop residues, and we're, we're minimally disturbing the soil structure. So generally systems with less tillage have higher aggregate stability than systems that have a lot of tillage. And this is a really important point. These are, I think, the, the oldest um, agricultural, long-term agricultural experiment in the US. And this is a point that soil organic matter will not continue to increase or decrease um, indefinitely. So they're, after a certain point of the same amount of inputs and outputs leaving the system, the system reaches equilibrium and you have something like this. So here started with, um, virgin prairie soil, when they tilled it, um, there was a lot of losses, especially after 70 years. This was continuous corn cultivation. And after 70 years, they released an, an, a new equilibrium of, so the organic matter didn't completely tank. There's, the inputs were sustaining basically this, this level of organic matter. A different system that also used manure and had clover sod in rotation um, was able to maintain a higher soil organic matter level. And that, that leveled off, basically those inputs sustained this level. And then as management changes are induced and we change that balance of inputs to outputs, we might reach a new steady state. So, and this is important as well for for thinking about building soil organic matter is, um, is there is some point of saturation and this might not be relevant for a one or two acre mixed vegetable farm where you can really dump on the organic matter compost to build really high organic matter levels. But in our 
in our larger systems eventually um, will reach a saturation point where it gets harder and harder to keep on building. So this is an important concept as well. So now maybe one more question if there's um, one that you think is good or. Yeah, I'll just start with the next one that was on the list. We've got about four on there. Um, so how can we specifically manage to enhance mineral associated organic matter? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, some colleagues at Penn State just had a really cool paper looking at different how different cover crop species impact those different pools. And, and a lot of uh, one of the big messages that's coming out of um, some of this new paradigm and research about mineral associated organic matter is that um, inputs that um, are basically easier for microbes to, to decompose and they decompose them more efficiently, especially more, I guess we call them labile or juicier organic matter inputs, actually lead to more efficient growth of microbes, which leads to more of that microbial biomass and microbial death um, being stabilized and, and um, being stabilized on mineral surfaces. So that's really, really cool um, because normally we think about it's just the amount that, that matters, but it's not just the amount that matters. It's also the quality of organic matter and, um, and basically having inputs that, that, have, um, that are easier for microbes to decompose more efficiently. And by efficiently, I'm, I mean basically more of that carbon that they're working on remains in biomass than, than goes off as CO2. Um, so, and, and it turns out that when microbes decompose something like a grass straw that has a hard, higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, they'll be less efficient at processing those. So that's, I think, one area um, where we could be, that, that shows us that it's not only about the inputs, it also is about the quality of the inputs that we're adding to the soil. So not, not sure I answered it the clearest, but, um, that that's important. And also looking at, I think one, one area is looking at soils that have, that are further from their saturation. Um, and, and some of the research has shown that basically those soils lower and getting organic matter are more efficiently and, and gonna, gonna add soil or mineral associated organic matter carbon, um, quicker than soils that are maybe already closer to that point. So awesome. now we're gonna to switch to nitrogen cycle and agricultural systems. We have our big nitrogen gas, some ammonia, nitrate and nitrous oxide, which is an important one. So the nitrogen cycle is really unique. Also like the carbon cycle, very mediated by microbes. Most of the processes in the nitrogen cycle have a microbe that's controlling that, um, and soil organic matter plays a central role. So it's pretty interesting to learn originally that that nitrogen gas makes up seventy eight percent of the atmosphere, but it's it's not available because there's, as you learned in high school chemistry or environmental science, that 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 um, triple bond between those nitrogen gas basically makes it virtually inaccessible to plants except for um, legumes and, and we can now fix it with fossil fuels. And nitrogen is typically the most limiting nutrient to plant growth, but um, which we'll talk about later. Um, now nitrogen, we, we add too much night. Humans have basically doubled the amount of nitrogen, more than doubled the amount of nitrogen in the environment. So now we have to think about it both as limiting nutrient as an as excessive nutrient. One thing that's interesting about nitrogen cycling is that more than 90% of the nitrogen is bound up in organic matter. That's why um, that inorganic nitrogen 
is not really included in your routine nutrient analysis. If you send it to a lab, you'll, you'll get um, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and other nutrients, but inorganic nitrogen isn't usually included because it's such a snapshot of what's happening because it's basically a lot has to do with that processing of organic matter. So most of these transformations in the cycle are mediated by microbes, nitrogen fixation, mineralization, which is decomposition of organic matter into mineral nutrients, and then nitrification, which is this conversion of ammonium to nitrate, and denitrification, which is this conversion of nitrate back to nitrous oxide, which is which we need to be very thinking about as well um, in terms of our net greenhouse gas emissions. So predict, to predict the state and fate of nitrogen in the system, we need to understand how those nitro microbes work and what under what soil environment they thrive or they don't thrive because that can help us think about our management as well. So this is kind of a fun slide, the ancient mariners struggle, but the nitrogen version, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. So our atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, but nitrogen is the key limiting nutrient in our agricultural and, and also in many natural systems. So the main forms of nitrogen, this is dinitrogen in the atmosphere, which it's basically inaccessible, except by, by rhizobia and things like that. Um, and the organic, most of that nitrogen in organic matter is in our amino acids and proteins. And we can also add it to our systems through things like compost and manure and guano. And the organic matter isn't reactive, but as, um, and we basically call, um, inorganic nitrogen reactive because it can react and be taken up by plants and it's available um, as, as this and organic matter as it's decomposed releases these forms that our plants can take up ammonium and nitrate. Um, I won't talk about that. So before, before World War II, we were basically stuck with, with this pathway of bacteria in symbiosis um, with, with leguminous plants, them creating a special home that the bacteria could do their work in the nodules with low oxygen environment so they could um, fix nitrogen and that could be added to the soil. And then after World War II, we figured out basically this Haber-Bosch process, which has dramatically changed the nitrogen cycle. And we can use high temperatures, natural gas, metal catalyst to basically um, do this process of converting nitrogen into available into fertilizer. And this is very energy intensive and is a lot, has a large, a um, lot of the energy costs associated with that. So I'm just gonna show this quick. This is a really important graph. Um, humans have more than doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen in the environment and primarily through our basic production of fertilizers. So natural systems um, maybe create about 100 of this every year, basically through, through legumes. And then human agriculture and, and the Saber-Bosch process have, have more than doubled what happens naturally. So in the past, ecologists used to just think about nitrogen limitation. But now we have to really think about excess and, and using the right amount in our systems and reducing those losses. So nitrogen concerns is in crop production systems is, is a top cost for farmers. And, and we've seen that very recently as those costs have gone dramatically higher. And that's actually um, made farmers and, and people that work with farmers think think a lot about this. This this gets you thinking about reducing nitrogen inputs and, and alternatives. Um, when it's cheap, um, you, there's not as much pressure to think about how can I reduce my inputs or how can I get better rate. We know that maybe we have very low nitrogen use efficiency with our fertilizers, only 30, 70 percent actually goes up into the crop. And there's a lot of uncertainty to finding that right rate. So a lot of scientists spend their careers 
doing doing nitrogen work. So it's the largest energy input into cropping systems. And this is the greenhouse gas we really have to pay attention to because um, it's so much more potent than carbon dioxide. Also, we have a lot of water quality concerns. So this is just a quick snapshot and and just to focus, we think a lot of we focus a lot about carbon um, sequestration, but we also need to be thinking a lot about nitrogen because about 58% of the agricultural greenhouse gas emissions are coming from our our use of fertilizers. So that's twice the impact of aviation in our country. So we really need to be thinking about about nitrous oxides, and potentially is a lower hanging fruit. Reducing greenhouse gases is a lower hanging fruit than, than trying to sequester as well. So we need to be thinking about those both at the same time. So just a joke for your Friday, nitrous oxide emissions are no laughing matter. Obviously uh, the laughing gas that dentists use is nitrous oxide, but it, it really is no laughing matter. And there's been studies that have shown that maybe you're building soil organic matter, but if you, if if that system leads to more nitrous oxide emissions, you can actually cancel some of those that sequestration sequestration that you're doing. So this net greenhouse gas emissions is a really important concept because we need to be accounting for those three important greenhouse gases at once to get an accurate picture. And obviously, you know, nitrogen is um, usually limiting in our estuary and our coastal coastal waters. And this more than doubling effect of adding more reactive nitrogen to the environment has really led to the explosion of these dead zones around the world. And just a comparison is that in contrast, our fresh our streams and freshwater lakes, they're limited by phosphorus. So that's that's constraint on on land in our streams and freshwater lakes. So there's nitrogen's limiting in our estuaries and coastal waters, but phosphorus is limiting in our fresh water systems. So recap, soils are the largest and soils are organic matters, the largest terrestrial carbon sink. And that carbon and organic matter is the most relevant for agriculture and soil health. I think conceptualizing these soil organic matter types is, is important because we're gonna be hearing more and more about that as, as we explore carbon credit schemes and, and things like that and, and ways of counting it. The controls on soil organic matter dynamics and whether it's stable is really this balance between inputs and outputs. So we should be thinking about that as managers of our tools are trying to increase the inputs and reduce the outputs. Climate and soil type has an important role. Some soils just can't store as much carbon as other soils. Um, and obviously our management. So humans have doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen in the environment, and we've had serious impacts on agriculture, greenhouse gas emissions, and water quality. And I think a huge take home is there's a huge amount of hype about carbon sequestration, and that's why I got passionate about this topic and have studied this for the last 10 years. But we need to be thinking about carbon and nitrogen equally because um, potentially reducing emissions is easier than, than sequestering emissions. So with that, I we're at time, um, but thank you so much. And here's some wonderful resources to check out. And if people want to stay on longer, then we can do some questions. Sorry, I should have left more time for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Joseph, for that awesome presentation. Um, yeah, if you are willing, I'll, um, I think there are about three more questions on the list. I'm happy to read them off. Um, yeah. So the first is, what is the practical significance of the new view of stable organic matter? How does this change our management of soil health? Um, I think, and this is, I think, unresolved. We're still learning more about it and doing more research measuring these fractions so we can understand what the effects of management is on these, on these different fractions. But um, some of the thing I was answering for the question before, I think, I think the new view of stable organic matter, it does, does a lot of things. Um, specific, one of those stories that got me really interested in studying roots and, and root inputs into soil organic matter 
was a basically we found out that and, and maybe this is the summary the best way to answer this question shortly is that it's not only about the amount of input to the system um, there's more that's going on that drives stabilization so getting back to what i was saying is scientists have basically found that the root inputs um, the inputs while roots are living and also the roots themselves are much more likely to persist in the soil than the above ground inputs, which is pretty interesting and amazing because generally we have much more above ground biomass than below ground of our, especially of our agricultural plants. But, um, but I think that intimate growing all year round and releasing organic matter, pumping carbon into the soil and being an intimate association with microbes, which are in intimate association with the mineral soil, um, helps to, um, really helps to build that, that more stable organic matter. Um, so I think, I think the main takeaway is it doesn't, it's not only about the amount of inputs, although that's a, a good way to look at it too, but it also is about um, keeping keeping um, plants growing on the soil, living year round, and having this, this constant pump of carbon going into the soil. So yeah, I think the story is basically that the input type also matters in addition to the um, the total amount. But it's not straightforward, and we're going to be learning more. I think as people keep on doing that type of research. Great, thank you. Uh, and then the next question kind of relates to that question, uh, the question of soil depth as well. So how does the soil organic matter dilemma relate to the conversation of um, carbon sequestration testing and evaluating carbon credits based on 20 centimeter depth samples versus 100 centimeter depth samples? Um, I don't think it, um... I think it's something um, to be thinking about. Um, yeah, hundred centimeter. I mean, there's a there's kind of two questions there. There's one about um, soil organic matter dilemma relating to um, carbon sequestration testing, um, which yeah, I think you can have your cake and eat it is eat it too as well as like we need to be having having management strategies that are cycling this organic matter labile and it really fits with nutrient management you're not just gonna the point of doing agriculture is not just to stick a bunch of carbon in the soil um maybe biochar but um you need to you need to balance that and and thinking as a in terms of nutrient management i think is is the way so you're not just going to stick a bunch of high carbon nitrogen high high carbon organic matter in the soil that's going to stick around and give you greater stocks but it's going to mess up your nutrient cycling um so you need to be thinking about them both and agricultural managers are they're not going to do something that's going to um put their um put, tie up all their nutrients or something like that um I am really concerned. I think there's been a lot of um, talk about going really deep with sampling. And as someone that's done a lot of a lot of deep sampling, especially in New York, New York's very different than than Iowa, where you really need to go a meter or need to need to go a meter. But in New York, our soils are shallower. Um, we didn't have naturally prairie systems that that are inputting all that organic matter much deeper in the soil. We have a lot of soils with a lot of rocks, so there is some really impractical um, importance. I think we're probably, I mean, 30 centimeters is, I think, what a lot of people are talking to, and maybe at the max in New York State, we're going to do 60, 60 centimeters. Going deeper, I think, is you're just going to get really marginal returns, and it's, it's expensive. The cost of doing it is much more expensive than the value of that carbon that's resting down there, so I think we need to be careful about um, our sampling strategies because we can waste time and effort and money and trying to go too deep. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat. What is needed in order to reduce the nitrous oxide emissions that you highlighted? Yeah, so basically um, the denitrification, that process, it comes back to, to understanding the process. So those are an anaerobic organisms. Those organisms are usually more active when there's less oxygen in the soil. And that happens to be when soils are really wet. So we get bursts in, in late winter and spring when our soils are really saturated. Um, another ingredient is also temperature is important as well. So higher, higher temperature and wet, but also a lot of um, fresh organic matter um, because basically those organisms are decomposing organic matter, but using different, um, not, they're not using oxygen like most of the microbes in the soil. So, I mean, you can have situations where you're doing something really good for soil health. You're having huge, um, luscious red clover cover crop, but with all of those things combined and especially high organic matter levels, um, you could have a situation where um, you're leading to really high nitrous oxide emissions and also the amount of, of the, the stuff, which is nitrate or ammonium. So those different ingredients all put together, you apply too much synthetic fertilizer. So applying the right rate in, in synchrony with what plants actually need. So there's not a huge amount left in the soil is, is number one. Um, Obviously it's our soils, sometimes we can't change our soils, but um, potentially having them be better drained um, is also important. So we don't have those situations where we have high nitrogen, high organic matter and um, low oxygen and wet soils, which really make that stuff go up. Um, so it's a lot. And I think the most, the best answer is we need to have nitrogen rates that that basically are in synchrony with what the plant needs. So there's not a lot left over to be able to be denitrified into nitrous oxide. Awesome. A long answer, but. Thank you. And I think that addresses all of the, the questions in the chat. We've got a, a resource in there on cultivation using cultivation tools in a series if anyone is interested. Um, but I think that wraps up the questions for today. But thank you again, Joseph, so much for being here today and your um, amazing presentation. Um, I think it's a great foundation for the rest of this webinar series and the field days as well. Um, and speaking of that, um, next week, we will have Jennifer Clifford presenting on Friday um, at noon. Uh, that's Friday, February 3rd at noon on financial and technical assistance that's available to help farmers implement practices for long-term fi farm viability. So if you have the link for today's webinar, that's the same link for um, next week. And we look forward to seeing you then. Um, just a final note that we will be working on making recordings available and we'll send um, information to the email address that you use to register. So thank you again, Joseph, and thank you again for everyone for attending today. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Happy Friday.